So in my previous video, putting the tower into practice, I showed people how to apply my pre-Adamic exposition to explain everything in Genesis. All those apologetic issues in Genesis that people struggle with. They're all solved once you understand this pre-Adamic view I'm talking about and put it into operation correctly. It solves all the problems of Genesis you ever had. Just bam. Right like that. It could take some time and meditation and maybe even just discussion with people and a little bit of debate or something like that. But you can see that this is just the right view. Okay. In this video, I'm going to do the same sort of thing again, but in a different area of my theology. I'm going to show you exactly how to put window theology into practice. Before we begin, let me just recap window theology for you. It is my belief that following the nation's failure to embrace her Messiah, God infused an elect entity with the Holy Spirit and a commission to preach the risen Lord abroad, provoking Israel to jealousy and repentance. And they were hoping to hasten in the long-awaited kingdom of God spoken of in the prophets. Acts 3. This Christian mission ended in frustration and failure, and the supernatural activity of the Spirit surrounding these people utterly ceased. So we didn't hasten it in, and the day of the Lord will come now at the time fixed by the Father's authority. Acts 1. That's the gist of it. Can you see that it's not the religion taught in the churches? Can you see the difference between this view and that held by churchendom generally? Can you see it? Okay. Now, you will never be able to unhear what I'm about to share with you. You're not going to be the same. You don't have to agree with me. In fact, most people won't agree with me at first, and that's okay. But I know you'll remember what I said, and it'll come back to your mind, and you'll think about it, and you'll wonder if it could be right. So I'm warning you now, you're going to be different after watching this video. You want the truth? You can't handle the truth! You've been warned then. Are you ready? Then let's look through the window together and solve some verses that have troubled a lot of people. The consciences of the faithful have been miserably vexed and flayed. Okay, here we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And if you're familiar with this section, 
Paul starts off sort of uh, rebuking them for not conducting themselves properly. After all, the church, the glorified church with Christ is going to judge the world. And in our time here, we should be conducting ourselves properly. And Paul makes a very interesting remark right here. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. Let me just read this real quick. Verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Now there's a couple things here. What does it mean to inherit the kingdom of God? This has to do with sonship. The sons of God, when they are glorified, inherit the kingdom and the world together with him. And this comes out in various verses. But we will rule from the heavens with Christ. This is the inheritance of the sons of God, okay? Now, what is absolutely necessary to understand here, this is Paul writing to his spirit-filled audience. In this first century context, where they were trying to hasten in the age they were trying to hasten in the coming age. They had the Holy Spirit and were empowered in this mission, empowered in righteousness and all kinds of miracles. And this will come out more in a couple more verses I want to look at. But the Spirit was empowering the true believers in righteousness. And as I've discussed in other videos with Lane, it is very evident in the early church that there were some among the church that did not have the spirit and needed to be expelled and needed to be distinguished from the true believers. This comes out big time in 1 John. It comes out in 1 Corinthians 4, at the end of that chapter. We're in 1 Corinthians here, in chapter 4, that comes out, okay? And it comes out in a lot of places. It comes out in Jude, it comes out in a lot of places. And so that is all very important context to keep in mind. This is not our situation today. We are not infused with the Spirit and empowered in righteousness to bring in the kingdom. We can't do that today. And we don't have the Spirit. And there's nothing we can do to hasten the Lord's coming today. That's what people must understand if they want to understand the New Testament. This will become more clear as I go to two more passages that are very much like this one. Because you need to remember the context of this. Pertains to this people. See this in verse 19? 1 Corinthians 6, 19. 
Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? There's an ownership, a slave issue here. So this is the Spirit-filled people on their mission. Let's go to the next passage. In Galatians chapter 5, we come across another passage similar to 1 Corinthians 6. Okay, let me read this to you. Verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Okay, now there was a law-keeping issue disturbing the Galatians and the nation keeping the Mosaic Covenant had to do with manifesting the Axis Mundi for the nation. This never was what the church was meant to do. The church was meant to be a witness to Israel and the church is not the nation and does not keep Mosaic law or anything like that. So people were encouraging these Galatian believers to keep law, which is not valid to a Christian in their mission, what they're doing for God. And so that kind of comes out here in the first part of Galatians. But look at what he says here. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Now here, eminence is coming out. It's very important to understand that the early church was on a mission to bring about an age, and eminency comes out all over the place in the New Testament. And it's coming out right here. And this is not Paul saying, we're waiting for the destruction of Jerusalem or any of these silly theories you hear out there. That is not what it's about. Okay. So, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will adopt no other view, but the one which is disturbing you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Would that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. That's actually a moment of humor from Paul there. He's saying those pressuring them to circumcise, he wished they would go all the way. It means that they wouldn't reproduce. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. Now here we get into a very important statement. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. 
But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Inherit the kingdom of God. So once again, this comes out. Now it's very important to understand he's talking about people that are led by the Spirit the Spirit-filled church on their mission. Now it's very interesting that up here in verse 13, he says, Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Now let me tell you something. The correct theology will be able to accept what this says and what this says, your theology needs to properly embrace everything said. Most of the positions out there taught in churchendom do not work. They don't do that. For example, there are people that will stress the works here to the point that sinning is indicative that a person just doesn't have the spirit altogether. There's some truth to that, but it's taken to an extreme by people today who really don't know who has the spirit. It's because nobody has it. They don't know that. But their faith, is their freedom for opportunity for the flesh? No, not really. If you would press James White with this, and his works gospel. How does his position have anything like this in it? It doesn't. This doesn't fit properly. The fullest, deepest explication of the relationship between faith alone and the necessity to walk in obedience to Christ is found in the concept of divine election, regeneration, and the nature of saving faith and the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God in conforming a people to the image of Christ. And you can begin to see that churchendom just doesn't have the right view at all. At all. But Paul is encouraging spirit-filled people to walk in the spirit. And what's so unfortunate today is preachers tell people they have the Spirit. They tell them, when you believe in Christ, you're regenerate of the Holy Spirit. That's not true, folks. It's made up. The Christian experience in the Holy Spirit was a fulfillment of Joel 2. You can see this in Acts 2. It was extended to the Gentiles in Acts 10. This is a new phenomena. There were not regenerate Old Testament saints, like R.C. Sproul says. Anyone who was a believer in the Old Testament had to be regenerate before they would be believer, a believer. And so anyone who was regenerate in the Old Testament was obviously uh, experienced the work uh, of God, the Holy Spirit, in changing the disposition of their soul. It's a ridiculous idea. These preachers don't have any clue what they're talking about. They're preaching some regeneration concept that's just made up and it comes from Rome. No! It's not the biblical teaching at all. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that did happen in the first century ceased. It ceased. We don't have the Spirit today. Nobody on earth has the Spirit today. 
So I could look James White in the eye and say, James, you don't have the Holy Ghost. And you're really going to struggle to see how the Holy Spirit of God has been working at all in down through the down through the entire period of the Christian church. That's how radically astray the churches are. And they're teaching their people and their pews that they are empowered by the Spirit to do these things. Well, I'm sorry, but people today who don't have the Spirit, as I know, when they read this, they know that they fall short. <laughs> Look, it doesn't stop there. It goes on. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. These also were boosted by the Holy Spirit. These Spirit-filled people on their mission were empowered in this by the Holy Spirit. Christians today try to practice these things, and that's good, but it's just by their own will and power that they're trying to practice this. They're not empowered of the Spirit. They, they, we, we, we don't do it very well, we fail. We feel like Romans 7 instead of Romans 8, don't we? There's a reason. And you need the right theology to understand it. Let's go to the final passage. Okay, the final passage comes from Ephesians 5. Where, again, we have this laid out for us. Now, they are people on a mission. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit now, guys. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. So Paul is contrasting true believers with the Spirit with, with those that will be destroyed by the wrath of God at the day of the Lord. He calls them the sons of disobedience. These are they who would be following satanic persuasion. It goes on. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. A very important term. Compare 1 Thessalonians 5 and study the war scroll 
of the Dead Sea Scrolls. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord and do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Do you see it? Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, in obedience to Christ. We're slaves of Christ. This is especially to the Spirit-filled believers, though, on their mission. So are you getting the idea? The apostles were encouraging the believers in righteous living by the power of the Spirit and encouraging them in other miracles in the power of the Spirit as they went about their mission in proclaiming the risen Lord and trying to hasten the coming of the day of God. That's what it's all about. But this baptism of the Holy Spirit at the hand of the ascended and glorified Christ was a sign to the nation that the day of the Lord was imminent. But that day of the Lord never did come. And your theology needs to make sense of that. So don't beat yourself up too bad when you can't mortify the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit, like Romans 8.13 says. Or this slaves of Christ issue that comes out in Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God that's at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. That's the power of the Spirit empowering the church on their mission. And it's not something we experience today. And the preachers of the churches in the various religions of the churches all teach you that you have the Spirit and you need to perform like this. And why? To hasten in an age? No, they don't even know about that. They think you need to do this for your own personal salvation. And that's why none of the preachers of churchendom can solve the works-grace dichotomy. None of them, whether it's James White and the Calvinists, whether it's N.T. Wright, whether it's Leighton Flowers, 
whoever of these Greek salvationists that think about personal heaven going of their soul all the time, they think that's all the Bible's about. They'll never solve the grace works dichotomy. They can't because they don't know what the original Christian movement was really about. And my theology does. Man, I never got it until I started listening to you. And then once I saw it, I didn't need to listen to you anymore because I could see it myself and it's dead on. And now things that don't make sense just make total sense. Exactly. Because I'm not telling you what to think. I'm saying, hey, you can't see this image from here. Step three feet over here. Just come right, come right here. Oh. What do you see right there? Yeah, now you see it, don't you?